Hi, I'm actor Ian Champion, and welcome to History of Horror Cinema, my personal podcast tour of the good, bad, and the ugly of horror movie history. If you like what you hear, please don't forget to hit subscribe. The Lady and the Monster, 1944 in 1942, renowned science fiction horror writer Kurt the Wolfman Siodmak published a novel called Donovan's Brain, which became an instant bestseller and led to three movie versions, of which the first was Republic's The Lady and the Monster in 1944. Despite being a Poverty Row studio, Republic made a solid, tense sci-fi horror thriller from the book. The original story, in diary form, recounts an attempt by Dr. Patrick Corey to sustain a brain extracted from the body of a multimillionaire, W. H. Donovan. Following a plane crash, he becomes telepathically possessed by the brain, his personality transformed for the worst into furthering the crooked deeds of its owner, who had murdered to cover his dubious financial route to the top. For the film translation directed by B-movie stalwart George Sherman, Writers Frederick Kohner and Dane Lussier made changes, specifically allowing Corey, Richard Arlen, to be an initially unwilling accomplice in the experimentation of an already mad scientist, Professor Muller, Eric von Stroheim. This was a shrewd move, as it gives Corey a greater character journey, descending from virtue into criminal corruption, and showcases a creditable range for the established tough-guy persona of Arlen. The actor was an ex-World War I pilot who found a novel, accidental way into the movie business by crashing his messenger delivery bike into the gates of Paramount Studios. His handsome looks caught the attention of their bosses, and he began a long if undistinguished career from there, most notably in the early Clara Bow World War I drama Wings in 1927. The role of Muller was an easy gig for the formidable Stroheim making the same use of his chilling Teutonic authority as in Republic's The Crime of Dr. Cresby back in 1935, which incidentally was the studio's last horror film for almost a decade until The Lady and the Monster. Stroheim's equally uncompromising manner as a film director led to his downfall, and a long period slumming it in B-movies till his memorable comeback in Billy Wilder's Sunset Boulevard in 1950. As Muller, his ethics-free megalomania is the catalyst for Corey's developing ruinous fascination. Another added plot element that amplifies the danger of Corey's seduction to the dark side is a love relationship with Janice, Vera Huber Ralston. Such is the temptation of Muller's potential breakthrough in brain preservation that Corey cannot follow his plan to take her away from the madman, actually her guardian, but with an unhealthy interest in protecting her. Regrettably for Stroheim, his role's impact is then reduced till the film's climax. Slightly more regrettable is the size of part handed to love interest Ralston. She is a weak actress, hitting single-note histrionics throughout. According to Internet Movie Database, under her real name of Vera Huber, she was a successful Czech ice skater before Republic's boss, Herbert J. Yates, had the idea to import her and promote his protégé translation girlfriend, to become the studio's hoped-for equivalent of Sonia Haney. Her performance is the sole one among the favourable cast that skates on thin ice. Arlen's work in the lead, though, is well shaded, not only by his convincing emotional degradation from relaxed affability into ferociously dark intensity, but by the moody film noir cinematography of the renowned John Arlen who distinguished himself in the genre with He Walked by Night and I the Jury, before sharing an Academy Award for Color Photography with Alfred Jilks for An American in Paris in 1951. Arlen's flamboyance of manner caused him to be relegated for a period to the lower-level studios such as Republic, much to their gain. His atmospheric lighting accentuates the unfolding sinister activities on screen, as well as the actors' performances, obscuring them in shadow according to their depth of corruption, most notably in the thunderous inner turmoil cast over Arlen's half-lit face. Suspended in a luminous tank, the brain is inert to begin with. Corey and Muller rack their own brains for how to enable the dormant Donovan to communicate with them. After they discuss the far-fetched possibility of telepathy, Corey feeds it a high dose of blood plasma, Suddenly, his dreams are encroached upon by a watery, burbling voice only he can hear. 
It is an urgent opening message from the dead millionaire. Once linked, it tells Corey his secret bank account code, and then we're off to the races, or rather, federal prison. The brain remote controlling Corey to his mental host's overriding mission. The young doctor becomes embroiled with Donovan's shady attorney, Eugene Fulton, played by Sidney Blackmer, later famously embodying occult coven master Roman Castavet in Rosemary's Baby, and his scheming widow, Chloe Donovan, Helen Vincent former real-life wife of tennis legend Fred Perry. Corey is inexplicably drawn to aid prisoner Roger Collins, William Henry, who, it turns out, take a deep breath, is a secret love child of Donovan, framed for the murder Donovan committed himself upon his secretary Howard, who was blackmailing his boss over threatened publication of a tell-all biography exposing his dirty dealings. With complicated plot business like this puppeteering Corey about, it becomes vital to shut down the crafty cortex. A dose of morphine is given by Muller. However, the sordid cerebellum grows in monstrous power to the point where it can even survive independently of electrical current, much to Muller's macabre delight. Worse still, it literally drives Corey into almost committing the unthinkable, running over a star witness in Collins' trial innocent teenager Mary Lou, Juanita Quigley, until Janice takes the wheel from him. Muller's frosty and ever-hovering housekeeper, Mrs. Fane, then emerges as a potential ally on the side of good, though Muller cruelly pinpoints her help as being motivated by jealousy of Janice, even her enlightened selfishness is valuable in fatally drugging the manipulative brain. Fane was played by Mary Nash, who established her formidability as society matriarch Margaret Lord in 1940's The Philadelphia Story. A laboratory climax belatedly returns Stroheim to make an impact as he holds Corey at gunpoint. The obligatory grapple between them is curtailed by Fane proving even more helpful by shooting Muller. The Lady and the Monster is an above-average supporting feature from Poverty Rose Republic the misleading poster campaign wrongly depicting Corey as a fanged demon in hat and coat was an unnecessary misfire, since the film stands up well enough on its technical skill, a mostly strong cast, and sets that show relatively decent production values. It would be remade in the future by MGM as Donovan's Brain in 1953 and as a West German-British co-production by director Freddie Francis as The Brain in 1962. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, please don't forget to hit subscribe.